so welcome to today's Twimble Online Meetup. This is the North America Schedule Meetup. So middle of the month in the evenings in North America or the Americas generally. Uh, and tonight's session will be headlined by Mahesh, who you just heard speaking, who will be walking through an entity embedding deep dive. Uh, but before that, uh, I'll spend a few minutes uh, just on a, a few kind of introductory words and then we'll dive into a community discussion. Uh, that'll bring us to about quarter after when Mahesh will start his presentation. Uh, and once again, uh, pay no attention to the distinction between the presentation and Q&A. Generally, Q&A happens throughout uh, and I'm sure that's fine for Mahesh. Uh, so a few words about upcoming meetups. The next meetup is going to be, uh, I don't actually have the date in front of me, but it's up on the site. Um, early December, uh, the EMEA's meetup. So the EMEA meetup or the EMEA scheduled meetup generally happens at the beginning of the month and it happens midday uh, in the Americas. So about noon or one o'clock for me. And that will feature a presentation by Sharon Glander on trust in machine learning predictions. And in particular, she's going to be reviewing some work by uh, Carlos Gestrin and his group at the University of Washington, the paper that preceded the Lyme paper on model explainability that uh, many folks are familiar with. Uh, and then the December Americas meetup, so middle of uh, December, will uh, feature Joey, who has presented in this meetup previously. Uh, he'll be reviewing a paper on adversarial examples. Uh, a quick note, if you haven't had a chance to see it, uh, the meetup page on the Twimmel website has been updated. I'm kind of excited about it. Uh, except for a particular bug that we need to address. But um, <clears throat> so it's a lot easier to find uh, kind of upcoming meetups. Previously, you could only see like the very next meetup, but now you can take a look at all the upcoming meetups uh, as well as study groups uh, via the site and then uh, easily access the recordings of the past meetups. We had that before, but um, it's a little bit easier to kind of go through things. The, the bug that I was mentioning is that uh, I think we need to subtract a day or something because this meetup that we're having now has already fallen off. So um, maybe if you were looking for it, it shows up in a, as a past meetup. Um, but uh, in any case, the, the EMEA meetup that I was referring to is Tuesday, December 4th, uh, at seven o'clock CEST and the uh, December meetup is Wednesday the 19th uh, at uh, five o'clock Pacific. Uh, there are also the study groups. Uh, Mesh and I were just chatting about the Fast AI Deep Learning study group, which is Saturday mornings and the machine learning study group, which uh, Sunday mornings, those are groups that are in progress, but feel free to uh, chime into those. Visitors are always welcome. Um, and of course, we're always looking for folks to uh, present papers at the meetup uh, and you can visit our CFP page uh, for that. Uh, and so that brings us to our community segment. And uh, as has been the case, I think the last couple of times, I really need your help because I've been super heads down and have not had much of an opportunity to uh, prep uh, topics. Uh, so I'd really like to hear, you know, your questions and comments about recent uh, shows, uh, topics or guests that you'd like to hear from, what you're working on, uh, things that have caught your interest in the news, such as recent papers or projects or news items, um, or just, you know, general things that you want to talk about with the group. Who's first? Sam, were you able to solve your problem, that problem that you had on your uh, CSS? 
uh, I was not able to have that solve that problem. That's kind of a off topic problem, but basically okay. I think it's like a, a bug on some particular versions of uh, Chrome on Mac. I don't know. It was okay. really okay. weird. Um, but yeah, we won't spend too much time on that one. Yes, yes. Uh, but I did see a tweet from somebody uh, earlier that was like, you know, hats off to the people who can get CSS to work the way they wanted to the first time. And that's definitely my experience with this particular bug in, in particular. Um, anybody see any new papers or research results recently that they found interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> I saw something just a few days ago. Um, I think it was out of Stanford, but I, I'm going to try and dig it up right now, um, showing that gradient descent found an optimal, like a global minimum, not just local minimums given certain conditions. So I saw cool. that headline. Yeah. Um, did you have you looked at the paper? Um, barely. I gotta say, I just, I think I saw it yesterday or the day before, and I'm in the part of uh, Los Angeles that's affected by the fires, so okay. it's been taking Sorry, a lot man. of my time. Oh, yeah, it's all right. Let me, let me, did you, do you have the link? Do you want me to share that? Uh, yeah, if you could share that in the chat, that would be great. Okay, uh, working on it. Sorry. All right. I'll try my, uh, by Googling it as well. Uh, yeah, this one seems harder to find than I'd have thought. I think what's interesting about that paper is that, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the way we think about uh, gradient descent and like setting learning rates and things like that is kind of predicated on this idea of, um, you know, finding local optima. And it sounds like someone has found some theoretical results that, oh, thanks, Sam. Some theoretical results that uh, talk about perhaps some conditions under which gradient descent can find uh, global optima. Uh, let's see. So, so I guess one of the interesting things here for me is that uh, at last year's NIPS uh, conference, uh, this year's NIPS is coming up soon, less than a month, but at last year's conference, one of the big um, kind of controversy, controversies, if you will, was a talk, actually it was part of an accept, acceptance speech by, um, why am I blanking on his name right now, but a, a Google researcher uh, who kind of was railing on the idea that there's not enough rigorous research around or rigorous understanding around the way deep learning works. It's like, we've got all these tricks in our tool bag, um, you know, early stopping and cyclical learning rates and all these kind of, you know, tricks that we've learned how to do, but we don't really understand why they work. Uh, and uh, he was kind of railing on that. And I think I would imagine that, uh, this is the kind of result that he would be excited to see, kind of some theoretical bounds around uh, when and why gradient descent uh, produces uh, a minimum, a global minimum. Just speculating based on the, the abstract of it. But very much a theoretical uh, mathematical paper here. Nice one. Any others? Or any other comments on that one? Um, yeah, I mean, to go a bit further with what you brought up, I do think just in the last month, I've seen a few papers that felt like laying rigorous mathematical foundations for how deep learning is doing what it's doing. Mm -hmm. I posted a link 
the Stanford paper I was thinking of was actually a different one. Um, I think it's out of their physics department called A Look at the Topology of Convolutional Neural Networks. Um, and then to me, it all kind of ties in with that Uber paper from uh, April or May of this year, the intrinsic dimension one, uh, which also felt like, you know, mathematical uh, restrictions on the, like, you know, type of manifold that a solution lays on, lies on in like data space uh, for these mm -hmm. problems. Nice. So I have, so this paper is by Gunnar Carlson and uh, a collaborator. Uh, Gunnar was on the podcast quite a while ago. Um, and I believe, um, that, uh, and he works on kind of geometric, uh, geometric machine learning. And I think Nina, who's also at Stanford may work with him or, or is working on similar things. And that was a, a much more recent podcast. So three, four podcasts ago. Um, but the whole uh, kind of topology and geometric models, um, that whole space I find really interesting, uh, but also very conceptually, uh, very conceptually challenging. Uh, do, any thoughts on, on this paper and what it's trying to do? Um, I, I have only glanced over this one, so I, I really <laughs> took you at, uh, literally when you asked if I'd seen any <laughs> interesting papers. Um, That's totally fair. Thank you for, uh, stepping up with these. But these are definitely at the top of my, uh, to read list because, yeah, I think that, you know, engineering so far has really outpaced the, like, theoretical foundations in deep learning, and it, uh -huh. I think cool stuff is going to come of, you know, theory catching up with practice. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Uh, so they're looking at, uh, I mean, this reminds me of the early work by uh, Matt Ziegler that is really familiar where you're kind of looking at the different layers in a CNN and trying to understand what they represent. And that work did it um, kind of pictorially. Uh, so we, we got to see kind of pretty pictures of shapes and, and textures and things like that. And it looks like this work is doing similar work, but trying to do it uh, in a more rigorous way based on what they're calling topological data analysis. Uh, looks like a really interesting paper for sure. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, I have a good friend who's a professor in the math department at UT Austin. I think he used to collaborate with uh, Gunnar Carlson for a while. So he, he put this on my radar. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, so what else are folks working on? Anything, uh, anyone working on any, any interesting projects, either, uh, you know, side projects, personal work stuff for the next, uh, minute before we turn things over to Mahesh. All right, well, Mahesh, uh, I think that is your cue. I'm going to stop the share here and I'll let you get going. You're welcome. Just give me a minute. To... Yep. Uh, just by way of background while Mahesh is getting set up, uh, Mahesh, as well as some of the other folks that you see kind of uh, leading the, the various study groups, uh, Kai and Christian and, and others, for <clears throat> all of us kind of went through the, the first fast.ai 
deep learning study group together um, based on the older version of the course. And I think you'll see uh, in Mahesh's presentation and kind of hear in his enthusiasm for this topic that you know, that is a really is a great course. Um, and it's been very impactful for those of us who have gone through it. Uh, Katz, I know you're um, taking that one now, uh, and perhaps some of the some uh, of the rest of you. But uh, if you haven't taken a look at those, you know, whether in the context of our study groups or independent of those, I definitely take, you know, suggest that you do. Uh, and uh, Mahesh, thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Crap. <sighs> okay, of course. You start? I got it. Go ahead. So this is the topic, and uh, these are the three papers that uh, I will be looking at in terms of the usage of uh, entity embeddings. The first two papers are really the, the Kaggle competition papers. And the last one is uh, the one which describes the YouTube uh, recommendation system. Uh, I have put in the dates over here because, uh, you know, in the fast AI course, uh, uh, the second paper author, you know, want uh, tried to show that he was the, you know, he had invented the concept, but uh, as you can see, the first paper preceded the, you know, the second one almost uh, by a year. So I put in the dates. So this is the first paper, Artificial Neural Networks uh, for Taxi Destination Problem by Joshua Benjo's team. Uh, they won the first place uh, uh, prize in this competition. Uh, this is the second paper, uh, the one which was uh, referenced by Jeremy Howard in this fast AI course, where he spoke about, uh, you know, the he actually introduced the concept of uh, entity embeddings. And uh, the competition was for predicting the sales of uh, Rossman stores. And the authors of these papers were third place winners but they had zero knowledge of the retail uh, vertical. In fact, the, the team which won the first prize was a company which was only specializing in uh, the retail uh, sector. And they had a lot of complicated models with, uh, you know, with heavy feature engineering using their domain knowledge. But this particular uh, uh, competitor, Geng Kuo, he, they essentially had uh, no knowledge, but they were able to get the third prize. And this is the paper on the on YouTube uh, recommendation system. And it's interesting that this paper came out in September 2016. And uh, but as you go through the paper, you realize that Google has been working on this for a pretty long, pretty much long time. So my guess is that they have been using entity embeddings far much longer than anybody else by the virtue size and scale of their uh, you know, operations. So before we do a deep dive, just, just some simple basics. What are entity embeddings? Why are they important? So from a layperson's perspective, entities are simply nouns. You know, so you will run across entities in every information system that you work with. So just to keep things simple, I like to, I like to look out for nouns uh, in my information systems. And I, these are the entities. The mathematics, uh, Wikipedia defines embedding as an instance of a mathematical structure which is contained within another instance. I think this is also pretty much uh, simple. So this is uh, uh, a simple you know, representation of an entity where I have a noun and I have an array which is a single dimension array of uh, D elements. So I could have a store entity, I could have a product entity, I could have a customer entity, supplier entity. Uh, this was covered as Sam mentioned uh, on 14th July more in detail. Uh, but again, that was focusing on the Rossman store sales. So in case anybody has is interest, you can, you know, you can see this uh, link and go through it. Why are entity embeddings important? Excuse Two main me. reasons. Oh. One is the what is the difference between a 
Sorry, embedding, um, what is the difference between an embedding and a factor? Uh, I, I didn't get you. Can you repeat the question, please? The difference between an embedding and a vector. Well, well no, uh, not vector A, um, a feature, excuse me. A feature? Yes, because it, it sounds like the same thing, just another name. Yeah, a feature is essentially an attribute. You know, uh, for instance, uh, a customer uh, will have a customer will have an account number. Account number could be a feature of the customer. A customer will have a location that will be a, you know, a feature of the customer. But an, an uh, embedding is the mathematical representation of that attribute. So where, where we are talking about the, uh, you know, a single value of, let's say, an attribute being represented as a, a rank one tensor or a vector of uh, some dimensions. Is it clear? Yeah, I think maybe I would Thank you. add that what one of the things that's kind of exciting about this is that you can turn uh, entity embeddings allow you to turn kind of common business objects uh, into features like your, you know, your products or your stores or your, um, your, you know, uh, users, things like that. These are all things that you can, you can kind of represent as a vector and turn into features of a deep learning uh, algorithm. Okay, shall I go ahead? Yep. Okay, so uh, the importance is really in terms of uh, the, the domain knowledge which is needed for feature engineering is, uh, is reduced for making predictions in our AI models. And the second importance is that, uh, you know, these are independent of any specific AI or ML method. So essentially for me, this is, as Sam mentioned, uh, it, it's very exciting because you can take business objects and you can, you know, represent them in uh, entity embeddings. And these can then be used within the organization irrespective of uh, different uh, AI or machine learning models or architectures. We will see in the papers, a couple of papers, they actually use, they actually mention this as a great advantage. So uh, they can be looked at from two perspectives. We will start off with word embeddings in the natural language uh, processing uh, AI tasks. And uh, we will look at uh, real world entities and events, what Sam mentioned in terms of the business objects. We look at the categorical data types and the matrix mathematics, which <clears throat> led to the evolution of the one hot encoded vector into entity embeddings. So let's, let's look at the word embeddings uh, part of it. Essentially in uh, natural language processing, word embeddings is a similar concept where a word can be represented as a vector of multiple elements. So I could have a word called cat, which is represented as an array of, uh, let's say, you know, multiple dimensions. I mean, a single row or a single vector. Uh, essentially what, what it is doing is that the function W over here is a function which is mapping a word to very high dimensional vector between 400 to 600. There is a very good paper uh, uh, by Christopher Ola, which is there on uh, which I, the link I have provided, which talks about this great explanation. So what it is doing is that when, when it starts, before it starts the task, it initializes the uh, the the matrix uh, or uh, or the single dimensional vector randomly, and after the task has been completed, you know the the uh, the function has got certain values which have got learned after performing the task. So let's take two simple tasks. Let's have a task for predicting the validity of a sentence, and another task which is to analyze the sentence sentiment. I have used a simple notation of a deep neural network <clears throat> where I show the inputs and the predictions. So when I look at the, when I look at a sentence called the cat sat on the mat, this is the input travels into the, into the neural network 
and this is a valid uh, sentence so the prediction is one similarly if i have a i i i i feel in an invalid sentence the prediction is zero so essentially what it is doing is that word embeddings for each of these words in the sentence the cat sat on the mat each of these are being initialized into word embeddings and through the process of gradient descent they are being learned by the dnn same thing is happening for the invalid sentence so essentially when we have the uh, multiple in, in you know in the training set you would have these embeddings which would be fed into the neural networks and you would get uh, the the word embeddings getting initialized or getting uh, getting their final values through the through the back propagation process and gradient descent uh this diagram looks very complicated but it is not on the lower right hand side is the is the representation of uh, the you know of the process which is happening in christian ola's uh, paper where you have a dnn which is uh, looking at all the word embeddings which are coming and it is uh, giving a prediction of it is mapping it to one lower below you have an invalid sentence which is again getting mapped to zero and uh, i have just shown the equivalence of arf the terminology which is used in the paper as well as the dnn the terminology which i have used so we saw the task uh, of sentence validity it's important to understand that each embedding that is the, the embedding that is getting generated is specific to the task of sentence validity so in case there is a new task the word embeddings for cat would change this is a very important concept to understand so let's look at a new task of analyzing the sentence the sentiment of a sentence if i see this particular uh, slide i have got two sentences the cat sat on the mat which as per the link mentioned uh, the you know it it is a positive sentiment uh, it it's giving a score of 100 and if i see the second sentence the cat ate the rat from a rat's point of view it's you know it it's a negative uh, sentiment so the uh, this particular tool actually gives the sentiment scores but they have not uh, they have they have not used embeddings i have just used i have just shown the terminology of the embedding over here as in example the point is that for a sentence sentiment the cat embedding would turn out to be a completely different uh, set of vectors so the same word cat will have different embeddings vectors based on the task on which the dnn made the prediction so this will work not only for word embeddings it also works for entity embeddings so for example sam mentioned the uh, business objects so a customer business object in the context of an accounts receivable system could have a different embedding the same customer uh, you know object in terms of the service uh, issues could have a different uh, embedding and as we will see later some of the large industrial uh, systems uh, use averages of embeddings in their future you know in the in their work across the organization word word embedding leads to word mathematics so essentially we are converting a word into a mathematical representation so it's it's you know the the system is able to figure out relationships as the one ones which are shown over here you will also uh, it it on it not only learns uh, you know it also learns uh, things like the entry capital this is taken from the tensor flow example it it learns uh, you know it learns the the tense of the verbs and this is this is when i say learns essentially the task uh, is just taking in sentences of english language or any other language in the context of word embeddings and it's throwing out the these particular relationships based only on the positions of the words it has found across the you know millions and millions of documents that it has uh, it has looked at so when we look at word embeddings we now move into uh the similarity into entity embedding so what are we actually doing we are taking in a discrete value and we are mapping it into a multi dimensional space where the values with similar function outputs are closer to each other so for instance if i see this particular slide you know it it says that uh, 
uh, it shows that uh, walking and walked are closer to each other in a in some multi-dimensional mathematical space so in the fast ai course jeremy howard uses the terminology of a rank one tensor but it's essentially a vector it's just a simple vector of multiple elements any questions so far is it clear can i move ahead any questions for Mahesh? Uh, feel free to chime in now or uh, punch them in via the chat. Go well, ahead. I'm. Um, oh, sure. Go ahead, Cass. I read a little bit on NLP, and their approach was to uh, take each character and to give it a number and to process it that way rather than entities. Or in words among beddings or entity among beddings. <clears throat> so there must be a map somewhere for these values. And it's actually using numbers. Or no, they're actually using cats. The cat sat it on the mat or something, instead of a numerical representation of that inside the the uh, the network. Well, the entity embeddings or, or the, the word embeddings are still numerical representations. I think what is interesting about them in the context of word embeddings or it, rather in the context of NLP is that they are a lot richer than some of the early kind of statistical NLP methods like bag of words where you're just kind of essentially counting how many times a word appears in a document, but you're not retaining any of the semantic relationships between the words. Uh, whereas with uh, entity embeddings, as Mahesh is describing, you kind of capture all that and it opens up a lot of possibilities for exploring the relationships between the different words in your corpus or your document. So uh, in the context here, you're using transfer learning, or instead you're starting with some kind of a document and you just run it through uh, to generate this. Mahesh, are you going to talk about the relationship between embeddings and transfer learning, like glove vectors and that kind of thing? No, not right now, because uh, I wanted to... Uh, you know, there are many advanced topics which we thought we will, uh, you know, in the context of this presentation would not have been relevant. But I, what I can do is I can share some links uh, on the Slack channel later on. If somebody's okay. interested, we can share some more information. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thanks, Mahesh. Yeah. So now let's look at the real world entities and events. We are looking at structured data and the categorical data types, the matrix uh, mathematics and the evolution of the one-hot encoded vector. So this is a simple diagram which looks at the data types which are there in uh, most uh, information systems. So broadly, you have two data types. Uh, you have categorical and you have numerical. Uh, this is really one of the most important slides one needs to understand in terms of the what are the different types of uh, variables uh, which are there. Categorical essentially indicates uh, you know, the different types uh, in terms of whether a gender, a marital status, you know, let's say in, in, in the context of a customer, it could be a payment status. These categories are uh, often label encoded. For example, we could have, uh, uh, for, for married, we could say, okay, zero as married, one as single, two as divorced. And then you have the numeric uh, type of variables. Now, every information system essentially has these two type of variables. You would have categorical variables, you would have numeric uh, variables. Now the decision as to what variable to be treated as categorical or numeric is really a very important decision. Now uh, in, in the terminology, what we find is continuous variables is a word which is used in most of the AI machine learning literature. Uh, there are uh, there are there are a lot of write-ups on you know how to how to how to look at uh, these both these types of variables, but these are the two broad types of categories, uh, two two broad types of variables that you will find in any data model of any entity. 
So entity embeddings are for categorical variables only, because uh, neural networks only understand mathematics. A neural network does not know what married or single means. It uh, so when that's how you know we 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 resort to label encoding where we say okay zero is married, one is single. But as we can see, there are problems in this. You know, in the in the matrix multiplication, a widowed person by weight of three is considered thrice more important than single. You know, a married person has got uh, zero value because whatever uh, weights get multiplied becomes zero. A possible solution is that we do a one-hotted, one-hot encoded vector binarization of these categories. What is a one-hot encoded vector? You only you you for instance when you look at zero. you you translate it into a matrix where you have one at the first position and zero elsewhere similarly for single you have you know zero at the first position and so on but one hot encoding has got problems memory computation for instance this is a sparse matrix so when you are looking at uh, systems which in all involve billions and billions of uh, parameters and variables and you have to multiply sparse matrices which have only ones and zeros it leads to a lot of memory computation without adding commensurate uh, value and there are arbitrary differences between the levels as we saw for instance we saw married has got a level of 3 and you know widowed has got a level of 1 it doesn't make any sense in real world so we entity embeddings came out as an evolution of one hot encoded vectors because entity embeddings in matrix multiplication are the matrix dot product of one hot encoded data and learnable weights so when i have when i have a when i have a single vector which is r rows by one dimension when i multiply that by a row with multiple columns as shown this is the this is the vector that i will get similarly as i move down as i keep multiplying the the the, the ones i will you know the, the results on the right hand side essentially represent the weight vector of uh, in the matrix multiplication so this was used as a uh, as a tool in the earlier machine learning libraries where you would have the lookup where you would have the entity uh, coded values would essentially the the entity embeddings would be the lookup row for specific values of the categorical variables so as we said entity embeddings are mapping the discrete values into a multi dimensional space so essentially what we are doing is wherever we see the categorical variables we replace those individual values with with a with with a row of multiple uh, values so my my marital status will have entity embeddings which are the, the the weights for every record similar will happen with gender and the other categorical variables so where we are so essentially every row of my record is getting multiply is getting replaced with multiple elements in the in the uh, instead of one single value google has google tensorflow has got a name for this they call categorical variables as wide they call continuous variables as model as deep the link shown has got much more information on this so when we now look at entity embeddings uh, when we when we take a high level view what are we actually doing we are feeding in some categorical and continuous variables into the network the categorical variables are getting replaced with uh, with uh, the entity embeddings and when we look at the libraries for instance fast ai has got a function called add date part which whenever it sees a date categorical variable it essentially replaces it with a rich you know library of uh, columns which only talk about the different dimensions of a date similarly tensorflow has got uh, uh, functions called as uh, categorical column with vocabulary list categorical column with hash bucket these are different kinds of columns and the libraries help help you make uh, you know make your job much more uh, much more simpler any questions on this can i go ahead yep okay 
Please continue. So now we look at the entity embeddings across the three papers that I that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, mind you, we are, I am only going to focus on the entity embeddings part of it of this because, as you will realize, each of these papers uh, has uh, got uh, a much broader prospect, you know, much broader bro broader perspective in terms of the problems that they were trying to solve, in terms of the uh, you know the architectures that were used the cost functions that were used. But since the topic was uh, the deep dive of the usage of entity embeddings, I thought I will just keep it simple and focus only on the portion of the, of where, how entity embeddings were used and what was some of the decisions which were taken. So the first paper was an artificial neural network applied to the taxi destination problem. Now this was just a single layer neural network. This was, I think, a multi-layer perceptron. That's why I have only shown one hidden layer in my diagram. So the prediction was when you had to predict the, the, the destination of a taxi, which was based on the, the beginning of the taxi trajectory represented as a variable length sequence of GPS points and certain associated meta information like the departure time, the taxi ID and the client information. Now, based on this, you know, and this was a data set for a complete year for a city which was used. Uh, again, the, prob the input variables were, bro were broken down into categorical and continuous variables. The categorical variables were represented by embeddings. In this case, we have a client ID, a taxi ID, and a taxi stand ID as the as the uh, embeddings. There were also uh, the, the time stamp of the start of taxi uh, departure time was converted into three embeddings. One embedding was quarter hour of the day, another embedding of was day of the week, and third was week of the year. Plus there were other continuous variables. Now, as you can see, for instance, you know, if, if, if one knows the uh, geographic uh, layout of a city, one can predict, for instance, what are the kind of taxi rides which will be, let's say, used on a weekend or which will be used uh, uh, on a weekday. So uh, the time dimension part of it, which is represented in these three embeddings over here, really turned out to be very useful as far as the predictions were concerned. The authors point out that the results prove that the embeddings significantly improved our models. So. This is the highlight when I spoke of the importance of embeddings. The first one is that a complete and almost fully automated approach was used with very little hand engineering and they, they ranked first out of uh, 381 teams. Now, very interestingly, they have used the, they have used embeddings, not only in the multi-layer perceptron, they've also used it in the recurrent neural network and a bi-directional recurrent neural network which they have documented in the paper. The paper has got much more data and statistics on you know, what were the results of uh, where they have used entity embeddings, where they have not used. And uh, this was one of the, since this was the first published uh, paper, which was almost uh, 2000, April 2016. So it's, it's significant from that point of view, hence we had selected it for the presentation today. May I share a question? Was, yeah, sorry. A question on the uh, chat. Um, Hafiz is saying so essentially, if you want to use entity embeddings for everything, one needs to substitute continuous variable with categorical variable. Uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, neural networks work with mathematics, neural networks need uh, continuous variables because you know the, the name itself continuous neural networks specialize in uh, continuous uh, functions so there is certain information that for instance where you are uh, predicting um, uh, the you know the, uh, the in terms of uh, substitution no you cannot substitute all continuous variables with categorical variables but uh, certain uh, certain uh, you know, you, you could, let's say, if you have uh, in the same uh, taxi destination problem, if you have, for instance, uh, the, 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 the duration of the taxi ride, 
duration of taxi ride you know will will depend it will it, it could vary from 30 minutes to let's say 300 minutes so you know the number the, the the difference in time is not very high but in some of the in some of the information systems for example if you are looking at sales you could have customers with zero sales you could have customers with million dollars of sales so the the, num the differences in the in the continuous function are very high so you cannot really uh, you know uh, uh, you cannot really uh, say that every continuous variable has to be replaced by a categorical variable i think in what fact, may be confusing here is the way that uh, a lot of these libraries treat dates by essentially converting them from continuous to categorical or <clears throat> or to yes, embeddings yes. with them so, and it uh, kind of begs the question you know, should other things be, you're essentially binning, right? Like, so, you know, your, the distance of your taxi ride or your sales, like, should you bin everything and try to use embeddings? Have you considered that argument? No, I would not consider that argument because uh, uh, the, the newer libraries, for instance, if you look at uh, the TensorFlow, which I mentioned, uh, you know, the wide and deep uh, model, they they have uh, when you when you pre-process the data it, it gives you a lot of options of looking at the data in terms of you know you can you can look you can remove cross relations from the data you can say okay these two columns are uh, you know similar to each other so i'm um, my my understanding is that as the libraries evolve and look we are only talking about this 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 has been you know this has been the, the usage of entity embeddings it has not only been it has just been two years so my 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 reading is that you will have much more uh, sophistication in the libraries as you know as the technology moves along okay. uh, you see the, the the question that you really need to ask yourself logically when you are when you are making uh, let's say when you are designing an ai or ml system is what is causing the sales to happen let's say what is causing the prediction to happen you know one just cannot blindly convert all continuous variables into you know into categorical variables so it does help the reason it helps is that uh, you know in a continuous variable you only have let's say one function you know one one value but if you are able to, if if that particular uh, if the attribute which is represented by that continuous variable has got much deeper meanings you know in the real world for example you know uh, i i gave an example here earlier of gender male and female now male female is just one is just one character uh, you know record in your uh, in your system either it will be m or it will be f but if you look at real world for example if you go to department stores you know you will have entire sections which are only for which are only for men entire sections which are only for women so uh, one needs to look at uh, you know when making the decision as to whether to move it from a con you know as a continuous or a categorical variable one needs to look at the the implications of the system in the real world in terms of the causality what is causing the prediction to happen am i clear thank you yeah yeah in the second paper when we see the we essentially uh, the, the prediction was to predict the daily sales of the rossman stores the there were two inputs to the data one was uh, daily sales data for 1000 plus stores and the second was uh, some more details about each of these stores and in this competition people were allowed to even look use external uh, data a lot of people used google uh, trends uh, data so again we, we we split it into categorical and continuous variables the categorical variables in this case which got converted into embeddings were again the store the day of the week the day the month year promotion promotion was whether a promotion was happening or not in that store and the state in which the store was located the uh, conclusion which was given by the authors was that the entity embeddings reveals the intrinsic properties of categorical variables and uh, uh, if 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 i if i see the quote which is uh, mentioned on the screen which was given by rachel she says that uh, the third place entry which was this paper was a single model with no domain specific feature engineering whereas the the, the first two place winners used complicated ensembles 
which are mixture of models and you know which they really had specialist knowledge and even in this paper for instance uh, the authors have uh, used entity embeddings on um, they used it on you know nearest neighbor they used it on random forest they used it on uh, gradient uh, boosting trees which really to me is again you know a key takeaway is that because it is uh, independent of your uh, you know architecture that uh, that you use you know it will withstand it will withstand the the pull and pushes of uh, technology because you know new tools and new techniques keep keep uh, coming along every day but if if you have a good uh, system of uh, generating uh, embeddings in your organization it you know it is something which will stand the test of time it's not something that you just use it once and throw it away the third paper was the is the youtube paper where we talk about the uh, recommendations uh, uh, the prediction is that uh, it's essentially a recommend uh, uh, it it predicts it shows you videos uh, based on your device type either mobile or laptop uh, which which according to which it finds personalized and these and these are displayed on your screen as per the ranking which is given by the network so the inputs uh, uh, is uh, it's a huge uh, corpus of the videos which are already on youtube there are other video candidate uh, sources a uh, user history and context and the video features this in this case actually there is not one there are two neural networks which were being used uh, which are being used uh, as per the paper so it's a two stage approach the first neural network is a deep uh, candidate generation model it it essentially tries to look at all the videos that uh, you know you would like to you would like to uh, a person would like to see and the second network ranks these videos based on certain features again we have same we have a categorical and we have continuous variables here the uh, the first model takes in a video corpus which is in millions and outputs uh, videos which are hundreds of videos the second one uh, takes in the balance uh, information and uh, it uh, gives you a score which is a uh, based on a rich set of features so the embeddings which are used in the first model are the video watches all the videos that you watch or the searches that one has done plus a geographic embedding you know the location the geography where you are from where you are logging in i think your ip address so these embeddings are used for the second uh, neural network it uses uh, a language embedding the language of the video it uses you know a video embedding description of the videos and uh, these are some of the comments which were made in the paper as regards the categorical features you know these are very complicated uh, categorical features in terms of uh, some of the you know, because as we can imagine it's a large uh, system that is being uh, you know used uh, over here so essentially what the authors are saying is that the embeddings are learned jointly with all the other model parameters through your normal process of uh, uh, gradient descent it's the largest and the most sophisticated system in terms of scale freshness and noise uh, they talk of a billion plus users and billion parameters and they said uh, that sharing embeddings is important for improving generalization speeding up training and improving memory and reducing memory requirements a key question to ask is what should be the size of the entity embeddings so how you know how large should your vector be uh, for a particular uh, categorical variable so there are different uh, parameters uh, there are different uh, insights which have been given jeremy believes it should be you know half the number of cardinal values plus 1 so if you have days of week 7 you will have 8 divided by 2 which is 4 in the taxi destination problem they have they have used only 10 in the categorical variables uh, paper they have this is a rule which they have used uh, interestingly uh, youtube recommends uh, uh, you know a proportionality to the log of number of unique values or cardinality of the entity I, this was the only you know definition i could find which was mathematically clear in terms of the recommendation where else uh, are entity embeddings used they are used in twitter twitter came out with a paper uh, just a uh, couple of months back 
where they speak not only of static embeddings, they also speak of uh, dynamic embeddings, dynamic both in terms of behavior and time. OpenAI 5, uh, there was a great uh, podcast which Sam hosted. I think Christy Dennison spoke about how even in the context of games, the, the Dota 2 games, they are using uh, embeddings uh, to you know, help, uh, help guide the neural networks. Pininterest, Instacart, Facebook uh, has a tool called Starspace. So as per Jeremy, there are huge uh, opportunities uh, you know, to solve problems that have not been solved before. For example, I just give an example. I think at the last meetup, there was a lady, she was talking about IC, ICD-9 medical uh, codes, uh, health codes in the healthcare domain. ICD-10 has been introduced about three years back. And uh, I believe a lot of opportunities exist in terms of mapping, you know, uh, ICD-10 codes uh, into entity uh, embeddings. So it's a new area and I, I believe it's, it's, it's got much more uh, potential in the years ahead. We look at uh, entity embeddings from two perspectives. There's actually one more third perspective, you know, it's, it's the understanding of the real world uh, entities and types. Because uh, what, as, as I've been saying, you know, we really need to ask a question as to what are the types of entities in the real world which cause uh, predictions to happen. So this is an area of uh, further work which I have not touched upon in this particular presentation. A summary, you know, of what I, what I spoke in terms of the, uh, uh, the importance of entity embeddings, the uh, importance of the categorical and the continuous variables, and uh, that's it. Any questions? I think I'm, I'm right on time. So any questions? You are. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. An interesting exchange in the, uh, the group chat. Uh, Julio asked basically, how do you, where do the embeddings come from? How do you, um, how do you learn them? And Alex responded, you can either a learn the embeddings as part of training, which is part of why they're so attractive since you don't have to hand engineer the features, or you can use transfer learning, which we uh, briefly touched on, or at least alluded to earlier, uh, where you load your embedding matrix with some existing set of embeddings that uh, someone else figured out for you. Yes, actually in the Twitter paper, you know, in the Twitter link uh, in the paper, uh, they speak uh, of uh, having a, in an embedding store a transfer learning is used uh, has been used very extensively as per the twitter paper since i since that was not the topic of this particular uh, you know our presentation i i didn't uh, dwell on it too much but it's a great paper and it i i think to to my mind it really is the state of the art in terms of uh, what uh, they are speaking uh, about uh, in the uh, in what they are doing so that that could be a good uh, reference point to start and I believe there is also an, there was also a presentation given by Twitter at one of the O'Reilly conferences, a uh, couple of, I think in September in San Francisco. So one could look that up. This is a paper which I was talking about in terms of mm -hmm. the... Uh, and I have uh, that, I'll put a link to that uh, Twitter blog post in the chat. It's a good one. Yes. Uh, so Julio, uh, says, for example, for word embedding, oh, I'm familiar with word embeddings, but would like to find an easy, obvious way to generate embeddings for other types of data. For example, for word embeddings, it seems you pre-train the embeddings using a prediction task and then use them in uh, other types of tasks like sentiment. But in the store example, you learn the date embeddings as part of the main task. But what if I mainly just want the date embeddings for another task? Uh, it depends on the task. Uh, see, uh, certain tasks which are uh, which are similar. My guess is that the embeddings uh, would uh, would work. Otherwise, what one can do is instead of having a random, uh, you know, uh, random initialization of the embeddings at the beginning of your new task, one could use the same. Uh, one could use the pre-generated uh, embeddings uh, of from another task. But uh, because whenever, whenever we, you know, whenever, see, w w essentially one has to understand what the neural network is really doing. It's looking at these millions and billions of parameters and it's trying to figure out the best continuous function, which it, which, which it can learn from the training data. 
so the, the the better data that we give it you know it would uh, it would uh, be uh, it would be much more useful and uh, easier for the model to predict i would highly recommend people going through the uh, the twitter paper because uh, even though it doesn't speak at much in uh, technical depth but it really talks about the state of the art in terms of uh, uh, you know how it's able to generate these kind of embeddings almost uh, uh, I, I, I would I would suggest almost in real time, which is if you recollect even in the presentation that we had in uh, in July, we spoke of this particular uh, possibility of you know almost real time generation of embeddings. Hmm. Awesome. Uh, well, Mahesh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to run through this with all of us. Really a great presentation. Uh, if you've got any more questions for Mahesh, he is very active on Slack, and I'm sure he'd be willing to uh, field them there. Uh, any final words or thoughts, anyone? Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Mahesh. Good night, Thank you. everyone. Thanks. thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.